we're going to jump in to a different topic here. We're going to change gears a little bit and dive into uh, genomics here. So um, for those who weren't here last year, la last year uh, we had the great um, joy of presenting really one of the most complete cannabis references completed to date. Now, there have been a lot of cannabis references generated over the years, and we've generated some, and many in this audience have as well, and they've been very difficult to read, uh, mainly because of the complexity of the genome. It's very polymorphic, and it's very AT-rich. So when we finally got an assembly put together with, with uh, Pacific Biosciences, it was really a joy of, uh, you know, a day of joy, because we had not really seen what all of these cannabinoid genes look like in relationship to one another. So today, we're going to shift gears a little bit and not talk about just that one reference genome that we built, but we're going to talk about 42 more of them uh, that we've since done, uh, since we started on this last year. So uh, this was funded by a cryptocurrency. Uh, there's a talk that we did last year describing how this was done. Uh, it was a five-month grant that was voted on by over 4,700 individuals around the world to contribute some cryptocurrency to this project to actually sequence uh, a cannabis genome. And this, this required about five months of effort, and in 60 days from being funded, we put the first assembly from Pacific Biosciences up on the web uh, at, a, I think it was a 660 KB N50. Now, you're going to hear a couple terms throughout this talk about how you monitor and assess the quality of cannabis genomes. Uh, N50 is a measurement of the average length of the contig sizes, and you want these things to get to be about the size of chromosomes, ideally. Uh, that is rarely ever the case. In fact, the first chromosome assembly for the human genome just occurred last month on, I don't know, one of the smaller chromosomes. Uh, and it's taken us like 19 years to figure that out uh, because the sequencing technologies really just can't handle some parts of genomes. Um, so this, after we put this public, uh, we quickly put up a preprint uh, to get the data public for everybody else after, after the August release. And I think this one had a, a even more contiguous assembly, and that N50 number was out to past three megabases. Now, the other term you're going to hear us talk about in terms of monitoring these genomes is a BUSCO score, which is an evaluation of how many genes you should have in the genome that are seen in all other plants. And if you're missing some of those, you probably have some completeness issues. Um, Okay, so we were seeing these genomes run up to a 97% BUSCO score, which is a great in silica way to tell you that your genome's getting close to being done, but really the, the nail in the coffin is when other people pick up the data and measure it with different techniques and come back with very similar numbers. And so I think there's some probably members in the audience that were involved in this wonderful work uh, on the proteome where they took cannabis proteomes or measured them via mass spec by doing a metabolite profile, and from there they were able to get peptide signatures they could map to the Jamaican lion reference, and they were, lo and behold, finding that the Jamaican lion reference produced the most number of peptides that matched their proteome data. And then uh, Reggie and his team with Keith Allen at Steep Hill also grabbed the Jamaican lion reference and then annotated all of the terpene synthase genes and recently published this paper in PLOS uh, about some unique features of the terpene genes that we now know about. So what's novel in the cannabis genome is that many of the terpene synthase genes have very long introns. Uh, this can be a problem if your assemblies are somewhat fragmented because you won't be able to piece these genes together in the correct order or orientation. Uh, these are 55 of the terpene synthase genes that they studied. Um, these cover the monoterpenes, the sesquiterpenes, uh, and I believe even some of the diterpenes. We're still digging into the triterpenes, which we're going to touch on a little bit later in this presentation. But there's great work here demonstrating that there is co-occurrence or co-expression of certain terpenes like humulene and beta carotene, and they're probably coming from the same genes. Okay, so uh, with that said, if you want to study the terpene synthase genes, you really have to look at the chloroplast genomes, because half of the pathway is inside the plastid genome. Uh, and to do that with Pacific Biosciences sequencing, you, you, you really need very high coverage and long reads to do this. Uh, these, um, this is a, a depiction here of what looks like 10 different chloroplast genomes that are in the plant. Now, we are expecting to find one. And now, two of these, I think we can rule out that they're actually nuclear um, genomes. Sorry, right there. These are what are known as uh, NUPs. There's a lot of transfer of DNA from chloroplasts to the autosomes, and as a result, you have to itemize which ones are actually in the autosomes and which ones are actually uh, in the organelles, because the ones in the autosomes are usually silenced with methylation. So we do, a, we do a, a, a quick scan on these to look at the depth of coverage we have across those contigs, and then how much methylation is actually present on those contigs, so that we can decide whether these are organellular or, or silenced autosomal copies of them. But this does bring us back 
back to um, some questions about the nature of chloroplast genomes. We're always taught in biology class that these things are circular, but the reality is when you have sequencing capacity of this power, you capture these organelles in the process of DNA replication uh, live. And so you, what you end up finding is not just a perfect circular genome, but a bit of a hydra where these, when these things are replicating, there are all of these photocompetent branches coming off the circle that have certain polymorphisms in them that we need to keep track of. The reason we're paying close attention to chloroplast uh, genetics here is that if you look through a lot of the genome engineering that's going on in plants, the vast majority of the yield improvements are coming out of modifying the photosynthesis pathways, moving things from C3 to C4 photosynthesis or modifying uh, parts of this, uh, of this genome. Those are seeing 50 percent, 40 percent yield increases in a variety of different um, organisms. And so we really have to understand the chloroplast genome to get yield right and to get the terpene synthases uh, done correctly as well. And this gentleman, Arnold Bendage, had, had put out some wonderful papers showing that genomes really aren't circular when you, when, you, when, you, um, uh, when you put them under a microscope, and we're seeing the same thing with the single molecule sequencing. So how, how do we do the methylation? Well, this was done with New England Biolabs. Now, the thing about cannabis is it's very hard to study its methylation patterns, because a lot of the single, uh, the single molecule sequencers out there aren't trained to look for these methylation patterns. They're much more complex than human methylomes. And so we're still resorting to an older technique known as bisulfite sequencing, which converts the genome, anything that has a non-methylated cytosine gets converted to a thymine, all right? So your genome then gets peeled into two different genomes, and it goes from 66 percent AT into 83 percent AT. This makes it really complicated to read with short reads. I think only about 50 percent of the genome is mappable once you do this. But nevertheless, you can still study some of the genes uh, and understand what's going on with methylation. So New England Biolabs developed this methylation kit that uh, is, uh, has less bias in the process of doing this assessment, and we, de we deployed it on five different tissues from the plant on female flowers, female seeded flowers, male flowers, leaves, and roots, so that we can get an understanding of what's going on um, throughout this process. And the most interesting thing that's, that pops out at you uh, when you look at differential methylation throughout the genome is methylation in the adestin gene. So the adestin gene is what makes the hemp seed so nutritious, all right? This is the globular protein that gets made in the hemp seed, and if we want to feed the world, we need to understand how to hyperexpress this protein. Well, what's interesting about the expression of this protein is you can see that it is differentially methylated in seeded flowers versus female flowers. And that makes sense. Once the, the, the female flowers get seeded, they start making seeds. So they turn the adestin gene into high gear, they hypomethylate it, take the methylation signals off, and let gene expression occur. When they want to shut it down, they methylate it, and this silences transcription. So we can see these methylation patterns, and they're beginning to correlate with the messenger RNA sequencing. The other gene you need to know about if you want to feed the world is the THC gene, right? This is one that uh, stimulates stimulates people to eat, particularly in cancer scenarios. And we can see similar methylation patterns there where the male flowers have these little red bars here, uh, and those things are effectively methylated and shut down, and the blue bars up here are signifying bases in the genome that are undermethylated or unmethylated, and so transcription is turned on. So we can look at just the methylation signals on the DNA to understand what genes might be active and which ones are inactive. Plants have different methylation than humans, as I mentioned before. There's CPG methylation, there's CHG methylation, and there's CHH methylation. Uh, and this means uh, the pattern's a little bit more complex to, um, to read than what we'd see in human genomes. Uh, and so what you end up seeing, uh, if you look at just flowers, like male flowers versus female flowers, you see a vast array of differential methylation signals between the genomes. Now, if you move over to female flowers and female seeded flowers, this picture becomes a little softer, because there's less differences between the genes between those different biological events. And if you actually categorize them for ones that are statistically significant, the genes that pop out are things like adestin and some of the cannabinoid synthase genes like THC. So the methylation patterns are giving us some picture of um, which genes are on and off, uh, and it's a very sort of simple survey that helps complement anything you do with RNA. Now, that does bring us to the RNA side of things. There's, uh, before I jump on there, there's 500 to 700 different sites that are hyper or hypermethylated with very strong p-values that we're paying close attention to and combing through. But you really want sequencing information of the RNA to understand what's going on here. And so there are these great new tools from Pacific Biosciences that allow you to sequence an entire RNA molecule 50 to 100 times over as a single molecule to get better than Sanger data to annotate genomes like this. This is something known as isoseq. And when we do this, uh, what you're seeing here is the lap, the number of laps that we're 
getting around the molecule, we turn these molecules into circles and they run like a gerbil on a wheel with a polymerase measuring incorporation and you can read this molecule over and over and over again with these sequencers to get very high accuracy. And what you're seeing down below is the average transcript read, uh, length that's in the genome. So some of them are getting out to be 5 kb genes, which is quite long, and you can see the average in there is around 1 to 2,000 uh, bases long. What this does, it gives us a picture of all the different isoforms that are in the genome. So an isoform is a, a version of a gene. Any given gene can have multiple exons, and those exons can be differentially spliced. And when they're differentially spliced, they create a different RNA molecule. So each gene can have two or three different RNA molecules coming off of it. That's what we call an isoform. And interestingly enough, the male flowers have more isoforms than the female flowers, and we're in a habit of getting rid of these things as fast as we can find them. Uh, but we might find some very interesting biology in there that uh, give us some pause on that, uh, on that genocide. So what else we can find um, from this is we can take these RNA molecules, we can then map them to the reference genome, and then identify where all the genes are in the genome, and so we can annotate the genome. And what we're seeing is around 27,000 genes uh, that are female gene models. And this gives us an, under, an estimation of the exome size inside cannabis as well. It's about 44 megabases of exome. Uh, there's 35 megabases of this that are coding, because parts of exomes can be UTRs. Uh, and there's 121 megabases that if you include the intron. So this is bigger than the human exome, yet the genome is about a third of the size of the human genome. So it's kind of an interesting adaptation that we're seeing in cannabis. And of course, if you're going to do this in females, you have to do it in males. We just saw that males have more isoforms. And so what we've done is taken all of the uh, RNA that we've done from those five tissues and mapped them against a male assembly that we now have. And we can identify that there's even more genes that are active in the male genome. There's 32,000 uh, 32, of those genes genes, and about 4,000 of them that are, that are differentially expressed in the male. This also helps us decorate the Y chromosome. We can see parts of the Y chromosome now that are about 80 megabases that do not recombine with the X chromosome, and about 30 megabases that is still recombining with the X chromosome. So if you're going to build any sex tests, you want to put it in the region of the Y that does not recombine, otherwise you'll, you'll run into some trouble. Uh, likewise, another paper, a great paper came out from the Orsborn Laboratory do, doing more mass spec on, on, on cannabis genomes, and we soaked up those FASTA files and compared them to the more recent references we have, and 98.8% of the mass spec data is detected inside the genome. Now, we have the, the advantage of being able to amplify RNA, so we can pick up more really low incident events. It's very hard to amplify proteins, and so it's not surprising that the protein systems are not finding all of the peptides. They're finding about 40% of what we see in the genome. But there's a very high overlap with what they do find as being real. And so these can be very complementary tools because you can pick up glycosylation and other signals with, uh, with the mass spec data. Okay, so let's, let's look at a couple examples. Here's a, here's a gene um, that has been studied heavily by Jonathan Page uh, called the, uh, the pinyl transferase gene. It's involved in taking olivetolic acid and converting it into cannabigeric acid, but it can do it in two different ways. Uh, and the plant predominantly is, is making this form, CBGA. But what we're seeing in the genome is that there are several cases of tissue-specific expression of alternative isoforms, where we see two exons skipped in the female flowers and three exons skipped in the male flowers. We don't know what that means. It may have uh, some, may play some role in giving us some alternative um, uh, synthesized cannabinoids. It's, that's uh, something yet to be, yet to be resolved. Now, there's some other things people always ask is what other genes are being co-inherited with the cannabinoids, right? Uh, these cannabinoid synthase gene clusters have been shown to have very low recombination between them. So it, it makes you question what's in linkage to equilibrium with them. What other genes are coming along for the ride on those haplotigs? Well, this is the cannabichromine synthase gene cluster. There's eight copies of the gene, all directionally oriented in one direction. And on the boundaries of this, of this gene, we see molectin expression and we see anchorin expression. These are genes that are known to be involved in pathogen defense that seem to be going along for the ride with cannabichromine. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting little story. The THC synthase story is even more interesting in that what you see flanking THCS in the genome are transposases. These are enzymes that copy chunks of DNA and shuttle them all over the genome, and it's probably the reason why we have a cannabinoid gene expansion inside of cannabis. These transposons are probably cutting it and pasting it everywhere they can. Uh, but also within this same cluster are differentially expressed 
cannabinoid synthase genes that we don't know what they do. These are getting differentially expressed in different tissues, and this particular one shocked us because it actually has an intron in it. Most cannabinoid synthase genes are believed to be one exon, very easy to study. Uh, when they start having introns, then they can alternatively splice and give you more combinatorics on, on isoforms. And so that's the first time we've seen uh, an intron inside of a functional uh, cannabinoid synthase gene, at least one that's getting expressed in, in frame. What we see genome-wide is about 90 of these different genes that have PFAM um, designation as a cannabinoid synthase gene. So there's a lot of uh, genes to, uh, to come through here. This is one that stood out on the, the CBDS um, contig. This is what's known as a self-incompatibility protein that's used to prevent plants from self-pollinating. All right, so if you have a, an obligate outcrosser, uh, you're gonna probably want this gene so you can't self yourself. Now this is probably a historical remnant of the hemp lines, which were known to be monoecious, but once we move to dioecious plants, those things become obligate outcrossers, and we don't know what the function of this is, but it's only expressed in male flowers. It may be, may be very helpful to understand if we want to understand hermaphroditism because hermaphroditism uh, is, is, is probably linked into this uh, into the split. Uh, now, what you can see here is is that uh, this self incompatibility gene is tissue specifically expressed only in male flowers and happens to be right next door to CBDAS, including a bunch of other novel synthase genes that are differentially expressed as well in a very tissue specific manner. So we have a lot to do to understand the complexity of the cannabinoid synthase genes and we can't just be looking in female flowers to find it. We're going to have to be looking at, uh, at multiple tissues to, to understand this. Um, so in speaking of that, we have to also look at the male genomes. The male uh, X, X and Y chromosomes, they're the largest chromosomes in cannabis, uh, and the y, the y is actually larger than the X. So what's on the Y chromosome? Well, what we did is we took the RNA off of the male flowers, mapped it to the female reference genome we have, and the reads that didn't map to the female, we would then map back to the male genome to, to tell us which ones were male specifically expressed. Uh, that gives you a hint as to what parts of the genome are in fact the Y chromosome because none of this stuff matches to the female genome. However, female genomes can also have a lot of structural variation in there. So this doesn't necessarily tell us that this is all Y. It tells us it's either Y or it's in a structural variant in the, in the female genome. And we're going to touch on structural variants in just a minute. But this does give us a list of over 118 megabases of, of target genome that is differentially expressed or only expressed in the males compared to the females. And there's a lot of um, gene content in there as well that um, to pay attention to. Now, if you really want to resolve the Y perfectly, the right thing to do is to sequence three genomes, what's known as a trio, a brother, a sister, and their offspring spring is what we chose to sequence here, so it's a bit of an inbred cross. And when you do this, you end up with fairly routine uh, N50s over a megabase. In all cases, we did not do any optimization here. We basically just purified high molecular weight DNA, put it through the SQL2 platform, and out pop 1.6 megabase N50s. As a comparison of reference point, the Human Genome Project went down to the White House to celebrate 500 KB N50s back in 2000. Uh, and we're still waiting for Donald's invite to celebrate this one, um, but uh, I'm suspect it's coming in anytime soon. Uh, but all of the, all of the, the, the BUSCO scores are uh, easily above 97% with just using a single method. So this is actually really reassuring because in the past to tackle genomes like this, you'd have to deploy five or six different methods to really, to really kill it. And that's coming, I think, coming to a close soon. So this is the actual family of other um, Jamaican lions that we've sequenced. The rest of these we hit with a short read platform known as Illumina. Uh, and uh, you, what you're seeing above each one of these um, genome pictures here is a coverage map across the BT BD allele. The genes that we just went over from that are coding for the cannabinoid synthase genes, if you look at the coverage map across those, you can predict what cannabinoids the, the, the plant's going to make. All right, and that, that can be seen in um, this little diagram here. We can detect with um, this tool that's on Canopedia whether it's going to be a type 1, type 2, type 3, or type 4 plant just from the Illumina sequence coverage profiles alone. If they have an active THC allele, uh, we know that it's going to make some THC. If that's in combination with a CBD gene that's not even in the genome, we know it's a type 1 plant. When all three of these contigs are present, we know it's a type 2 plant. When only the active CBD contig is present and there is no THC contig or the CBDS in active we know it's going to be a type 3 plant. And when none of them are present, it tends to be a CBG plant. So just looking at the coverage maps alone, we can sort out um, its, its, uh, its chemical expression, at least on those three cannabinoids. The other thing that you want to do is compare this to other type 3 plants. So Chris Grassa is here and presenting later, later I think, today or tomorrow on uh, a genome that's a type 3 plant. 
plant, a hemp line known as CBDRX. Uh, and so we like to do is always align the reference genomes that we have with Jamaica Lion to what other people have found in other states and other jurisdictions to see that we come to some level of consensus on this. And we're beginning to see that with both the male and female genomes. What you're seeing here is a, continu it's a contiguous um, uh, alignment of our genome to theirs, and you see these diagonal lines. Those all represent the chromosomes, the 10 chromosomes that you see in cannabis. And so we're beginning to get genomes that now share a lot of, um, a lot of content. Now, the next thing that we did is we took 40 genomes and sequenced them with Illumina. Now, these are shorter read systems that can't get you to the whole genome and they can't get you all the structural variants, but they can get you to all the SNPs and the small insertions and deletions in the genome. So this here is a histogram of the number of variants that we see between the lines. The Jamaican lion genomes are here and there are usually two to three million variants between those siblings, but when you get up into comparing those to hemp lines, it jumps up to about 12 million variants, all right? As a um, perspective here, the human genome is going to have have about a tenth of the number of variants that we're seeing here per cannabis line. Um, it, there's about a variant every thousand bases in human, there's one every 90 bases here in cannabis. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity here that we have to comb through. Uh, we also have some sense of the insertions uh, and deletions from this data, data set as well. But what, what you can do when you have the RNA data layered on top of the genome is you know where all the genes are. So now you can take the variant information and ask, well, how many of those genes are broken by those variants? Do we have any, like, frame shift mutations? Do we have any stop codons that are disappearing? Do we have have any, uh, any start codons that are changing. And you do this with a program known as SNP EFF. It looks at the, high, the impact of the, of the variants. So we just went through and asked, how many high impact variants do we have per cultivar? Because uh, in humans, those numbers are really low. In plants, uh, in, like cannabis, there's over 2,200 high impact variants per cultivar. So um, we've got a lot to understand about what this type of uh, diversity actually, actually means. You can also take all of the sequencing data from the Illumina platform, map the, all 40 of the genomes uh, to the male reference, and what you see here are 40 genomes lined up top to bottom here. These top ones are male genomes, and we're looking at the density of coverage across all of the contigs in the genome, and it, what's interesting is the females uh, have none here. The red means there's no coverage, or at least twofold less coverage than, um, than average, and the yellow is twofold or greater more coverage than average, and so instantly from a picture like this, you can identify all the contigs that are present in the males, absent in the females, present at half the coverage in the males, and double the coverage in the females. That tells you X and Y. So now we've got a list of all the genetic content and the genes that are on X and Y, so we can begin to understand what things are really related to uh, hermaphroditism. A couple of interesting genes that pop out on the Y. We have some flowering loci we want to pay attention to. There's a calcone synthase in there. There's a trichome gene involved. There's a downy mildew resistance gene that's involved in there. So a um, lot of activity in the Y. We don't want to ignore that. Uh, but the other thing that popped out of this data completely accidentally was with three of the genomes that are in there from Colorado seeds. Uh, this is an interesting cross they've done that, um, that has some, some, it, 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 some interesting properties, I'll say. But what was interesting about this is there were these three hot spots that this to us is a copy number variant. When you see something really bright yellow on this map, it tells you it's been replicated. Uh, and without knowing that this plant was powdery mildew resistance, we called them up saying, hey, we have uh, regions of your genome that are amplified, and they happen to map to a, a, a gene that is powdery mildew resistant in hops. What do you know about this plant? And they said, well, that's interesting. This thing never gets powdery mildew. It's surrounded by it all the time, and uh, we want to know more about that. Uh, we weren't even looking for this, uh, and it just jumped out by looking at these, these coverage maps. So um, that might be an interesting marker that we want to track as we breed it into other plants. Uh, okay, so let's touch on structural variants. I still have some time uh, on structural variants. So many of you may be familiar with SNP chips. SNP chips are great for looking at single, single base pair variants, maybe some of the small indels. But when you want to look at things that are up to 50 base pair insertion and deletions, you usually migrate to, to something like an Illumina sequencer. Those are great at getting some of the indels uh, up to about that size. Once you start getting larger than that, it's very difficult to ascertain them with short reads. You need long reads to do this. And the important thing about doing this with long reads is that the, uh, the vast majority of the variant information in the genome is usually the structural variants. They're not very frequent in terms of their incident rate, but they happen to contain large chunks of DNA in almost entire genes. So you really need to pay attention to the structural variants and, um, and, and get on board with some of these long read sequencers. What you're seeing here is a graph of the, the, the variant size and the cumulative percent of, uh, percentage of them that, that they make up in a genome. And so you can see that there are a tremendous amount of uh, 
variants that are large, like 10 KB in size, and encompass a tremendous amount of either regulatory elements or genes. In humans, what you see is around seven of these per megabase. And then this jumps order of magnitude when you get into maize. There's about 70 of these per megabase. And you can see that the short read systems have a very low sensitivity for picking these things up. And so we're, we're blind to these if we're only using the Illumina sequencers. When you put in 20x coverage on these with these long reads, you see them all. And it becomes a really interesting story um, that is represented here. Here we can see over 17,000 heterozygous and almost 10,000 homozygous deletions in the male flower, almost an equal number of those of insertions. Likewise, um, the offspring there has a similar number of deletions and insertions. And the, in the, the histogram of the size of these things is down here below. So there's clearly some kind of repeat element in the genome that's jumping up at around 10 KB um, as being inserted and deleted in, in, inside the genome. Uh, this makes you question what the heck is in this stuff. If, if this is just one inbred cross in a trio and there's this much stuff jumping around, this is like an eighth of the genome in structural variation. This is extraordinarily plastic when it comes to, uh, com it comes to a genome. And it's not necessarily containing boring things. We're seeing terpene synthase genes that are in these parts, in these structural variants in the genome. All right, so TPS17 is a beta myrcene gene. We also have um, other TPS10 and TPS30 like, or, or perhaps making alpha pinene and D limonene. Um, not all, in, in the terpene landscape, a single gene does not make a single terpene. One gene can make multiple terpenes, and there can be multiple copies of that gene make, contributing to the same terpene. So just by this beta um, myrcene being dropped out doesn't mean it doesn't make any myrcene. Uh, there's other genes that will probably haplocompensate for that. But we also see this in the triterpenes. Nobody is measuring for triterpenes right now in the labs. We need to be looking at these things because the flavanols are in there and people are publishing on how the canflavin genes are in fact having an impact in pancreatic cancer and in pain. Uh, yet it's a molecule that the plant makes that we don't track. Uh, likewise, these other um, triterpenes seem to have some interesting characteristics as well and we think uh, we'd love to see those getting into the analytical chemistry labs. Now we're tracking all of this stuff in a, in a, in a website known as Canopedia. Uh, and what this uh, system enables is for people to sequence partial genomes or complete genomes and put the data public or hold it private depending on their need. But it allows you to compare that genome to everything else we have in the database. So you can get a phylogenetic tree of what it's related to and what it's most distant to and how heterozygous it is and how backcrossed it is. And we can also scan for the BTBD allele to know if you, what type of plant it is and, and whether that's going to step on any intellectual property that's out there. But all of this is, is, is linked into a, a blockchain system so that the time Timestamps and the notarizations are uneditable by us. If we disappear, your data still has links into a blockchain that is distributed around the world, and your timestamps cannot be changed by anyone at our company. Um, now, this is, uh, we're starting to integrate some genome browsers into this as well, so people can kind of peruse their genome next to, this is down below, this is what the 40 genomes uh, SNP variant file looks like. There's looks like there's almost a SNP at every single location throughout the genome when you put this many uh, genomes in there. But if you zoom in, it's not that, it's not that, uh, it's not that sparse. But um, nevertheless, it can be a very helpful tool for, for analyzing your genome. And now, since the data up there is public, there's been over seven publications that have just scraped data off of that site and published their own analysis of it. So it's, it's been thoroughly vetted, um, and it's, it's, it's growing every day. So with a few minutes left, I'm just going to touch on what you can do. What applications can you do with uh, genome structures like this and, and sequences like this? Well, the we, first thing we started to do was to build a fingerprinting tool that only needed 16 SNPs to identify cannabis strain. Uh, and we want it to, be, it to be 16 SNPs so we can do it on a quantitative PCR instrument in an hour. We don't have to necessarily send it out to a sequencing lab. We can, uh, we can basically get parentage information from 16 wells in a 96 well plate. Uh, inside that, that system that we've built, we also have that CBD um, and THC allele. So we can measure the BTBD allele on a plant with a genotype in a, in a PCR well now, which is quite nice. And it also makes you want to think about doing RNA uh, PCR. Can you do qPCR and RNA of the terpenes or the cannabinoid genes to understand at what stages of development are you getting hyper or hypo expression of those genes? Uh, and then we're beginning to work on viruses as well. There's some great work that was published by uh, Dark Heart Nurseries recently on the hops latent virus. Um, so we've made an assay out of what they discovered. And we also did a assay out of lettuce chlorosis virus that was published in Israel recently, and threw in a third one known as CCV1, so you can start to track the actual um, uh, viruses that might be spreading through the population. And then two other things that we're playing around with is some work with Arbor, where we're making different panels that can capture uh, a thousand genes or 50 genes at a time and sequence those, so that people can take more bite-sized pieces out of the genome and analyze them. Um, this current one has the synthase, synthase genes and the adestin genes. I think they have a booth here describing this 
panel that they've built, and a lot of that was built off the uh, Jamaican lion references. Uh, and we're also making multiplex tools to measure the microbes that are in the plant. And down below there is just a five color aspergillus assay for, for tracking things in, uh, in California. And then the final thing we're just toying around with is really early is pollen traps. There's all this problems with pollen floating onto open, uh, open field cannabis farms right now. And so we are trying to do here is quantitate the amount of male pollen that's in the air and the amount of THC laden pollen that's in the air with these $50 pollen traps that you can throw in the corners of your property and see if there are uh, a lot of pollen that's blowing in that might be destroying your grow in the next couple of years. So a lot can be done with genetics. And I want to thank all of these people that helped us do it. Um, Dash really kicked off the snowballing of this, and then PacBio was pivotal in providing the, the technology that could sequence these genomes. Uh, New England BioLabs did a lot of the methylation work and some of the sequencing work work on the NovaSeq, and we've done some work with phase genomics and the other parties here to actually piece the, uh, the genome uh, in some more contiguous shape. And then all of these people were, uh, were required to, to make this happen. It really does take a village and a tremendous amount of collaboration, as Dr. Machulam was saying. So uh, with that, I want to leave a few seconds here for, for questions, if possible, and um, if not, we will roll over to the, the next section, which I think is a panel. Thank you. Thank you.